have a communion Sabbath today, but I'd like to begin with uh, the first angel's message. I just never tire of reading this. Let's turn to it, Revelation 14, 6, and 7. It's a vital part, and a vital part of our message is the hour of his judgment has come. It's in this message. So let's look at it. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Okay, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. I'd like to spend a little time this morning to see if we, if we together... Uh, can uh, gain a better understanding. The judgment hour has uniquely within it a sense of urgency. Wouldn't you say that? When we talk about the judgment hour, we're talking about a sense of urgency. Uh, the gospel proclamation is in the framework of the judgment. Everlasting gospel, judgment. They're in the same room in this passage. It's communion Sabbath, and so... We might aptly ask the question, what does communion have to do with the judgment? And to, a to answer that, I would say much in every way. The first angel starts with the everlasting gospel. Communion service is certainly about the everlasting gospel, isn't it? Good news, glad tidings, happy message, everlasting gospel. And the bread and wine that we partake of this morning are symbols of his passion for us, right? He loves us with a great passion. And the gospel of Jesus in Revelation 14, 6, and 7 is in the same room as the judgment. It's the everlasting gospel in the setting of the judgment hour that's going on in heaven. Notice that at the last part of this passage, it says, for the hour of God's judgment has come. That word for is a very interesting expression, probably an important part to that passage. Everlasting gospel, because for the hour of his judgment has come. It brings the gospel into a more critical focus than ever before in the history of the world. Let's begin with a solid Bible premise about God's character. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to this passage. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Here's a so solid Bible premise about God's character. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. I see the pages turning. If you have it, say amen. amen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some uncount slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should what? Perish. Perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is not slack. That's how God thinks. This is the mind of Christ. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. This is Jeremiah. Who's he talking to here? A rebellious nation, right? And this is what God is like. He's talking to a nation in rebellion against him. He says, my thoughts to you are thoughts of peace and not thoughts of evil. There's never been a human being for whom God's desire is anything but short, anything short of eternal life. The evidence is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That word whosoever is a, is a very interesting word, isn't it? Whosoever, we're all whosoever's. This whole town is filled with people that are whosoever's and uh, the world as well. If this is true, 
then why would the, why would the father judge anyone? The answer to that question is a little, is a little interesting. Actually, he doesn't, and he won't. The Father doesn't judge anybody. God the Father won't judge any of us. I'd like to have you turn with me to John 5, verse 22. John 5, verse 22. John 5, verse 22. For the Father, what does it say? Judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. How much judgment to the Son? All judgment. Jesus is our judge. You know, it's, it's interesting. He's also our advocate. He's our friend in court. He's our friend. He's our Savior. And he's our judge. And for a very good reason that the Father doesn't judge any man, but Jesus is our judge. The re reason is found in verse 27. John 5, verse 27, just over a few verses. It says, And has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he was, is what? The Son of Man. Because he's the Son of Man. I hope you caught that. All judgment is given to the Son because he is the Son of Man. As the Son of Man, he was tempted like all of us are every day. The Son of Man became us. He became Wayne and Jim and Alvin and all the rest of us. He became us. He's the one who carried our sorrows and our griefs. He's the one who suffered and died for us. He's our high priest in heaven. And all that he has, all that he has done for us. Now turn with me. I, I wasn't going to have us turn here, but Hebrews 9.24 is, has an interesting idea in this connection. Hebrews 9 verse 24. Hebrews 9 verse 24. Hebrews 9, verse 24, a little while before Revelation, not too far. Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. What does it say next? For us. Everything he's done is for us. What an idea that is. That's uh, the one who is our judge. He invested his very nature and life into our salvation. His very nature and life. Do you know he took on an existence he never knew before? And he'll always be that way, one of us. I can't imagine that. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. I think he had already done that. But now he becomes one of us. I, I, I think that is such a comforting thought for me to think about. The question, is not, the question not to ask is, how can I possibly make it? Does anybody ever have that, that kind of a thought in your mind? We all have. But that's not the question. That's not the right question to ask. How can I possibly make it? The real question should be, in view of all of this, how can I lose Jesus is my brother. He's made like unto his brethren in all points. We're all brothers in the generic sense. He's our companion in temptation. I have total confidence and assurance of victory and judgment because he's my judge. How would you like to have God's job? Do you think he's going to be fair? Do you think he's going to be merciful? Do you think he's going to be righteous? Philippians 1 verse 6. A few pages to the left of where we are here. Philippians 1 verse 6. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians 1, verse 6. <clears throat> Philippians 1, verse 6. Being, what's the next word? Confident. Confident. You know, there should be an assurance to salvation. We shouldn't go along through life wondering if we're going to make it or not. Give your heart to Jesus and allow him to work his grace in your heart and extend his grace to you and you can be confident. Being confident of this very thing that he which be, has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now somebody says here, well, you're reading, out of, you're, you're reading a little bit different than my Bible. I have an, a King James, the old King James Version, but it's easy read. It just takes some of the these and thous out. That's not the New King James Version, but if it reads a little different than yours, well, I realize that it's, it's the same thing. <clears throat> he who started a good work in you will perform it until the day of judgment. Yes, you may have a li list of sin sins as long as your arm, a list longer than than your good deeds, for sure, right? I think I look back on my life and I see very little good there. The sins far outweigh the good things I've done. And I think we all look and, and we can, can, uh, can commiserate with that. In that vein, let's compare two verses. John 5, 39 and 40. We were in John. It's the real John. Somebody in a Bible study once said to me, is it the little John or the big John? This is John, chapter 5. He's the author of all those. And he's also the author of the book of Revelation, isn't he? John 5, verses 39 and 40. John 5, 39 and 40. Search the scriptures. For in them... Now he's talking... Who's he talking to here? <laughs> he's talking to the Pharisees, Right? Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Things are, may not be as they, well, they appear, as they always appear. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. So he's, um, he's uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting idea. You, why did, why would, would they not have eternal life? They would not come to him. Now, let's compare that with um, Romans 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Therefore now no what? Condemnation. Condemnation is a word from the, law, from the law courts. It has to do with judgment, doesn't it? And there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who come to him. He says, you, you, you don't have salvation because you won't come. And uh, so those who are in Christ Jesus, I wonder, do we see those who are lost at last will be because they did not come under the mediatorial wings of Jesus, who is our high priest in heavenly places. They refused him. They wouldn't come to Jesus. In view of all this, in view of all that he has done, they won't come. That's rebellion. That's rebellion. To not come is rebellious. Oh, how the heart of God must ache. In Isaiah, the first chapter, he's grieving over his children. Isaiah chapter 1. I just want to read that. Isaiah, the first chapter. Isaiah chapter 1. After Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah chapter 1. You know, my fingers don't work as good as they used to. How many of you have that trouble? <laughs> I look out over the congregation, and it, does, it looks pretty good today. But sometimes it looks like the first snow has fallen. Wait. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 7. It says, Because of savor of your 
Oh, I'm in. I'm still in the wrong place. Isaiah 1. Starting with verse 2. Hear, O heavens. He's opening this up to the universe now. He said, I've got children here. Now the whole universe, pay attention. See what's going on here on planet Earth. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give an ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have what? Rebelled against me. What is rebellion? It's refusing to come to him, right? He wouldn't come to me. The ox knows its owner and the ass its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. O oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt. Rebellion again. You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate and overthrown by strangers. They're lost not because Jesus played hard to get. Jesus does not play hard to get. They wouldn't come. They refused to come. Salvation is not something we attain by trying harder to meet the law's requirement, but more accurately, the law points us to Jesus. The law is our schoolmaster to do what? Point us to Jesus. We look in the mirror. The law is like a mirror. We look at the law and we realize that we need Jesus, right? So we come to him, our schoolmaster, to lead, lead us to Jesus. Expressed well in Galatians 3.24. Jesus offers all of this to us, to us, all this to us, even before we know, even before we know how to be good. So where does the fault lie? We can't earn it because He's already provided it. Is that right? And given it in the person of Jesus, everything He's offering me has already been accomplished in Himself. He is the, the model man, right? Salvation came, comes through him. I'd like to have us turn to Daniel 9, verse 24, where it talks about what, what is prophesied he would do when he did come. Now, this was prophesied almost 500 years before it happened. Daniel 9, verse 24. Daniel 9, verse 24. If you count as we read along, there is uh, six things here. There are six things. Daniel 9, verse 24, that Jesus would do when he came. And it prophesied so many years before. Seventy weeks, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon your people, upon the holy city, to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness. Did he do all that when he came? Indeed. To bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and, and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Six things here are listed that he would accomplish when he came, and he did. He accomplished it in our humanity. I'm glad about that. He had that identified so closely with me that he did it in my humanity. The believer in Jesus is in Christ. And he's judged righteous because Jesus is righteous. The judgment's good news. The more we know about Jesus, the more we have, the more we, we, we know that we have in him. Justification is being judged righteous before the law. And when we really survey the atonement and see what he's done, it will break our hearts. We'd never want to walk off and leave it. We're told to drink of the water of life freely, not sparingly. Fill the cup up, not half full. We'd rather die than sin when we really get it. 
Mary Magdalene was one who really got it, right? Abraham woke up one morning, the Lord's voice, take your son, your only son, to the mountain and offer him. And Abraham, I don't think, had to think twice. He knew God's voice. And he would rather die than not obey. And he's the father of the faithful, right? That's what faith is. And these, our victories, will be evidence in the judgment that we love Jesus. How we respond to what, to his, what he's offering us. On the other hand, if we persist in a course that says no to such a great salvation, we'll ultimately judge ourselves. Unworthy of eternal life. Unthankful, unholy. Do you know, he can't take rebels to heaven with him. He can only take people to heaven who are safe to save. So it's a hard situation, isn't it? How is our heart relate to him in view of all that he's done for us? Oh, how terrible he's grieved if we say no. He, with tears in his eyes, will say, why would you die? Why would you die? Why would you choose that? On the other hand, if we're found in him, no condemnation. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We can have that right now, this morning. I hope as we go through the communion service this morning that we'll think about this as we partake of the bread and the wine. We've passed from life to death. In the judgment of the living, we will be judged righteous because he is righteous. He will judge me according to his righteousness. And if we are in him, we will be judged righteous. It's just as simple as that. Psalms 35, 24, the psalmist, he is, he's pleading with God, judge me according to your righteousness. <laughs> okay. Wow, what kind of righteousness does God have in Christ? The only question to ever be asked by the Father in this process is what did you do with my son? How did you treat him? Did you come to him or did you say no? We make that decision every morning. In all sincerity, if we'll come to him and say yes every day, he will eagerly accept us, just like the man with the prodigal son, the father with the prodigal son. The judgment of those glad people who are in Christ will never mean the final declaration of their acquittal before the onlooking universe. What is the acquittal before the onlooking universe? It is, he that is righteous, let him be what? Righteous still, that's the verdict of the judgment. All such, for all such, the judgment is good news. It is so truly related to the everlasting gospel of Jesus. We look with great expectancy to the judgment of the living. The result is that the kingdom and the dominion is given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's Daniel chapter 7, 26 and 27. It's a judgment in favor of every believer. Now somebody says, somebody might say, well, it sounds to me like it's all too good to be true. Sounds a little bit like cheap grace to me. Somebody might say that. I remember in my experience, I used to say that. <laughs> when I heard the purest gospel, I say that's too good to be true. Cheap grace? To this I would say there's no such thing as cheap grace. Now we put that on something that we think is cheap grace, but when we're talking about God, it's not cheap grace. God's grace toward us costs God everything. Heaven is poured out in one gift. That's what we don't want to miss in all of this. It's not cheap. It costs somebody a lot to get it for us. Why would we turn away from it? Someone says, well, it sounds like you're just saying, well, I'm saved by grace through faith, so I can have the pleasures of sin and eternal life too. Is that what I'm saying? No, let's never say that. Never even think that. The Apostle Paul was accused of this same kind of thing, and they called it faulty theology when Paul said it. But do you remember what Paul said? Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we do what? Establish the law. Notice at his defense trial in Acts, the 24th chapter, 
his defense trial. He was being accused of, of being a lawbreaker. Acts chapter 24. Acts, the 24th chapter, and verse 14. It's easy to remember. Matthew 24, 14, you know what that says, right? This is Acts 24, 14. But this I confess to you, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in what? The law and the prophets. The great author of, of uh, justification by faith, uh, the Apostle Paul, he said, I haven't cast the law aside at all. I believe it has full, full strength. To everyone who has tasted of the sweet release of God's pardoning love, Grace, the purpose of holy living is as clear as the noonday sun. With hearts filled with gratitude and thanksgiving, we'd rather die than dishonor our best friend. It's a love relationship. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Will there be works there? Let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Notice now, this passage handles the works part of it. It's Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. This is familiar to all of us. There are people here, I'm sure, that can quote this by heart. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of man, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Then verse 10. I'm glad this one's here. For, when we see a for, we should ask ourselves, what is it there for, right? For, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to what? To good works. He said, we're not saved by works, lest we begin boasting about it. But he said, if you come to Jesus... And you accept his grace. If you come to him in all faith, guess what happens? You are a new creation, created to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is a love relationship. Uh, it's not a work but it's a walk with Jesus every day. Where does this love come from? We can't even manufacture that, can we? Where do we get it from? Romans 5.5 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. The Holy Spirit, God. There's nothing we can, there's no, nothing self-generated in any of this. What we do is we turn to him. We come to him. He says, you don't have because you don't, don't ask. So the evidence is the good works. These are the fruit of our faith. That's why we can be saved by grace and judged by works, because the works are the evidence that we've come to him. We don't want to cut the cart before the horse here. It doesn't work that way. The fruit is the evidence and the judgment, our good works are not payments for the debt we owe. I want to say that again. Our good works are not payments for the debt we owe. How big is the debt? If we had a million lifetimes, we'd never be able to pay off the debt by our good works. The good works are the evidence that, uh, that, with, that, that we have been in Christ. They are the praise and thanksgiving for God, what God has done for us. Praise and thanksgiving. The Psalms are just loaded with those ideas of praise and thanksgiving. That is the motivation that we have to serve him every day. Uh, today we're going to partake and remember again of the symbols of his passion for us. How deep did his passion run? <laughs> it took him to the Garden of Gethsemane where things got so bad that as he's clinching his fingers into the dirt, very dirt, and drops of blood falling from his forehead. He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I can't stand it anymore. That's his passion for us. But not my will, but what? Your will be done. 
And the father didn't intervene. Did you notice that? And who was he thinking of? Us. That's God's passion for us. And uh, he was obedient even to death. And uh, so remember also again this morning the humility of our Savior. As he kneels down with a basin and he washes feet. Feet of disciples who were arguing with each other that night. (laughs) Imagine that. From there he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, how humble is our God. How humble. Somebody accosted me at the door one time when I said that. So how can you say that about God? He's humble. Oh, my. Humble means unselfishness. A heart that is born full of love for other people. And for us, most of all.